All right, so for today's class, usually for class, we start with a blank workbook, not today. Today, we're starting with something great and impressive called agent.xlsm. So the content for today, so go ahead and get that downloaded and open up that workbook. The content for today is working with password-protected websites. So there's some website that I, need, that I need to get data from. If that data is just like available, and I can just plug the URL and go straight to the page, the web query wizard is going to be great for that. But if it's either if it's password protected or if there's some information I have to fill out and click a button to get to the data that I want to get to, or the data that I want isn't shown on the page, but it's somewhere hidden in the HTML document. For instance, you might need an identifier that's a part of a link. It's a part of the URL that's in a link. You can't get that stuff with the web query wizard. Fortunately, we can get it with VBA, but it's a lot more involved. And that's what we're going to begin today. It's today and tomorrow, so we're planning on doing two days on this topic. This is one of those topics that almost nobody knows how to do in Excel. And so when you kind of bring in this ability, you will make chins drop wherever you go. And you'll get offers, you know, for employment and such. So this is a good one. I'm glad you're all here today because this is a really good one. Macros have been disabled. List of stock tickers, Google Doc. I don't even remember what all this is for. Let's begin just by kind of taking a look at what's built into this workbook. So far, all the modules we've worked with have been just insert module. They've been general modules. Today, when we look at this workbook that we've opened up, there's already a module called Agent, and it's a class module. It's a different kind of module. Class modules are where we define objects that we can then use in regular modules. And so what this is, this is a definition of an object. We've worked with lots of objects. There are a bunch of objects that are built into Excel. Some are built into the VBA language like a collection. We played with a collection uh, in last Wednesday's example. We created that object, and we worked with the methods of that, of that object. So that's the same thing here. This is an object. The only difference is this object is defined in VBA. All those other objects that we worked with are defined in some other language and made available to us in VBA. This one's right here in VBA. And so you've got the source for this object here. And my intention is to teach you to use this without needing to go into the source. But if you decide, man, I need this to do something different than it currently does, then you can go and see what that function is doing and make modifications to it. So this, is a, this, is a, a, this agent is a class that I have written over the past, whew, probably close to 20 years now, 20 years now. You would think in all that time I would have written documentation for it. Not, not, not really. So I'll teach you how to use it. You'll get some examples. You've got the source code if you really want to look and see what else it can do. So let's begin then by inserting a new module. So insert a regular old module. That's where we'll do our work. The class module has to be here. So if you're going to take what we're doing in this example today and take it to a different workbook, you will need to bring along this agent module. Ooh, how would you do that? Well, there's a couple ways you can do it. One, you can export these files. So you can like right click and say export file, and that will create a .bas file that has the full specification that you could then import into some other project. Alternatively, if you have two workbooks open at the same time, they will both show up here. So here's, I just made a new workbook. Here's book one. Here's my agent. I can just drag that into the other one, and it will copy it. So if you have both of these open, you can just drag from one to the other. It makes a copy of it, and you're ready to go. So those are the two main ways that I would suggest working with that agent class. All right. Let's begin hmm, some place that we can all log in. I'm going to come to Learning Suite. This commercial break brought to you by Learning Suite. And I'm going to, lo I'm going to log out. I guess I'm going to open up. I guess I want to stay logged in in Chrome. So I'm going to open up Firefox and do this in Firefox. Hmm, don't import anything. Hello, Firefox. Uh, how about not now?
and to Learning Suite. All right, so this is gonna be our first task, is to say I wanna be able to figure out where this box is and put in my net ID. I, want, I mean, I wanna have Excel do that for me, and then I want it to find this password thing, and I want it to come there and put in my password. And then I want it to find this button and click on it, or find the form that contains these text input boxes and submit that form. There's a couple different ways I can get this thing to move forward. One, tell the form to submit. Two, find this button and click on it. And that's what we'd like to do. Are we ready to do that? How many of you are going, oh, this is the good stuff? Yeah, this is the good stuff. I don't know what we did last time, but this is the good stuff. All right. So let's make a sub procedure. Sub, hmm, I'll call it uh, ls login. Ls log in. Now, we're going to be using the agent class to do this. And so here's how we declare an instance of that class. Dim, and then any variable name will do. I'll just call it A for short. The less I type, the better it is for everybody. So dim A as agent. Full credit for class participation. If someone can tell me something about how much memory is allocated when this statement's processed. So how much memory are we using when we say dim A as agent? I will settle for full credit. I will settle for, is it a little itty bitty tiny bit or is it more than a little itty bitty tiny bit? I've just narrowed it down to a 50% chance. You should be guessing. Those aren't your choices. Your choices are a little itty bitty tiny bit. <laughs> little, itty, bitty, tiny bit. It is a little itty bitty tiny bit. Right. Well, it's not just a bit. It's more than a bit, but it's, yeah, so full credit, but yeah. So the point is, all this does, this, all this statement does is it says, I'm going to need a name for this object that's going to get created. S and, and I'm going to call it A. It's a variable named A, so it's a, it's a name for a location in memory. And it's just enough memory to hold the address of where the object really is going to be created. We did this for the first time when we worked with the collection last, uh, last time we were together working with the collection object. So this gets me just enough room to store an address of where some object is so I can bind the name to it. Here's how I connect, actually, here's how I actually make an instance of that object. Set A equal to new A. So this new agent statement then actually says, oh, find the agent class, build that thing in memory, put it somewhere in memory. And does that take an itty bitty bit of memory or does it take more than an itty bitty bit of memory? It takes more. Is it a whole lot more? Not really a whole lot more, but it's more. There are several properties to this agent. Each one of those properties has to have a little in memory where it stores its value. So there's more. So now I can do stuff with the agent. A dot. And then we've got you know, several options that we can work with. All of these methods and properties are defined in this agent class. You could look at this and you find add form data. You could come in here and you could find add form data. There's a sub procedure. It's a method. It's how we define the method. It's just a sub procedure. That's how that method is defined. Okay, there's a question here. How's the question? So where is that stuff defined? There it is. Okay, hmm, before we get to working with, now let's go ahead and log in first. Let's go ahead and log in first. So I'm going to say a.visible equals true. I don't want this to be a secret agent. I don't want to be hidden. I want it to be a visible agent. It turns out that built into the into the, the core of this agent, built into this agent, there are two separate channels that can communicate with a web server. One is a, non, is a simple channel. It is non-visual. It's fast. And it just says, give me some information from this URL and bring it back. That channel will not allow you to create a, a session, meaning 
that where if you log in and your browser remembers that you're logged in, and you can go to other places after you've logged in, the non-visual channel doesn't let you do that. If you're going to do something where you say, I've got to log in once, and it has to remember that I'm logged in, then you're going to use the visual channel. And all the visual channel is, it's an implementation of the Internet Explorer object. And so we will, be, we will be remote controlling Internet Explorer. Now, how many of you would prefer to use some other agent, some other browser besides Internet Explorer? I'm with you. And you're actually welcome to use any browser that exposes its core functionality to the component object model. You want to hear the list of those? Internet Explorer. That's it. Even Edge doesn't expose its core functionality to the component object model. I expect it will at some point. It was still pretty new. And so Internet Explorer is it. So that's the bad news. We've got to use Internet Explorer. Good news is we can probably make it work OK. All right. So I'm going to say a.visible equals true. I'm going to put a breakpoint right here on my end sub. And then I'm going to run this. All it should do is show me Internet Explorer. But this Internet Explorer is going to be bound on to my agent. So I now have a handle that will let me control this guy. Now, whew, how come it hasn't loaded my default page? It's because when I open it this way, it says, hey, someone else is in charge. It doesn't even say I'm going to start off by going to my default page. It won't go anywhere unless I tell it to go somewhere. That's nice. So let's tell it to go somewhere. Well, I don't know where you want to tell Internet Explorer to go, but we're going to tell it to go to Learning Suite. So here's Internet Explorer. I guess I don't need it that big. Uh, window up. And I think that'll be wide enough. OK. So here's how we tell it to go to a particular page. A dot open page. And now I'm going to tell it the place where I want it to go. Now, it turns out it's a pretty common thing for web pages to say, listen, you're going to try to go somewhere deep inside this website. But when you first go there, it's going to say, hey, slow down, cowboy. You've got to sign in before you can go there. And so instead of just you know, coming here and signing in and then going somewhere, I want to, know, I want to put my final destination so that when I log in, it will actually take me to where I want to go. So I don't know, where do you want to go in Learning Suite? we go to Learning Suite, or should we go to some other resource on BYU campus? Yeah, I don't know. I guess we come to Learning Suite. So I'll just put here learningsuite.edu.edu, or learningsuite.byu.edu. And so instead of just logging in here, that's the URL I'm going to try to go to. So let's just see what happens if I try to go to this. Would you like to improve your search experience with a suggestion from Microsoft? No. I can't possibly improve. OK. So the point is, you'll notice that I typed in Learning Suite. And am I here? Is this where I am? Or has it redirected me? I thought he did. Oh, that's Firefox. OK. Right, yeah, yeah. But the point is, yeah. So you can see that here it has, it has redirected me to CAS. CAS stands for hmm, Central Authentication System. .byu.edu. And you'll notice here it says you're going to we're at the login page. That's what this page is. But the service, this parameter we're sending it, it's trying to tell me once we're done, we're going to go over here to Learning Suite. All right, so that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to tell it to go to that page. So open page, HTTP colon slash slash Learning Suite. .byu.edu. And if I had a more specific URL to go to, that would be fine as well. All right. It turns out that the agent uses the open page whether you want to use the visual channel or the non-visual channel. And so there's another parameter. After you tell it the URL, you've got to tell it, do you want it to use Internet Explorer or not? The default is not. And so we have to come here and say true. It would probably be more helpful if I named the, hmm. Now we'll leave it just like this. So this is going to say, don't just open a page non-visually, open it using Internet Explorer. Let me bring Internet Explorer back where we can see it, and I will drag my current statement indicator back to that line, and we'll run that statement. 
Now we can see we're going to Learning Suite. If you want to set up number 11, yeah, I guess I do. Use recommended, whatever that is. OK. I wish there was a button that's, that said, don't ever ask me again. There, don't enable, whatever that is. OK. So now I've got my agent. By the way, why do we call it an agent? Agent is the general term for a piece of software that interacts with a web server on behalf of a user. So it, it's, it's acting on my behalf to communicate with this web server. So that's, so browsers are agents, there are other agents as well. Okay, so now I've got to figure out how am I going to find this thing. Here's where it gets a little bit difficult. Oh, We've got to look at and understand the source HTML to track this guy down. We'll go ahead and do that, and then we may take a slightly easier approach to get there. So let's start off just by looking at the source of this page. Hmm. Two things I need you to, need you to understand. Ooh, full credit for class participation if you can tell me how in Internet Explorer I can see the source of the page I'm looking at. Do you need credit? You don't need it. Yeah. Right click and choose view source or view page source or something. View source. Very good. That's full credit. Give yourself some credit. Oh, and where does it bring it? Different than it used to. There's like one pixel wide I can drag on. Well, that's wonderful. Here's the source over here. Can I close these? I guess we're just going to have to go bigger. So, uh, that black egg. This one here? Ah. That's better. Thank you. All right. So what we're seeing here, then, is the source HTML of this page. Not a whole lot of HTML here, but still HTML that we've got to deal with. Here's the first thing you have to realize. So this is something that's a little bit troubling. If I just right click and go to the source, what I'm going to see is I'm going to see the HTML that was sent from the server to the browser. That's what the browser does. The browser is a program here. I type something into it and it says, aha, I got to communicate with the server. And it asks the server. The server says, oh yeah, here's what you asked for. And it sends back this raw HTML page. Back in the good old days of the 1990s, that's all that happened, well, the early 90s. And then a company called Netscape said, wouldn't it be better if we could make these web pages actually do something when they got here, have active content? They invented a language called JavaScript. And so now what can happen is once that HTML comes, the browser can say, oh, there's some JavaScript to run here. And it can change the way the HTML can, it can dynamically change the HTML. Here's the problem. When I just say right click and view source, I get the page that was sent to the browser before it's modified itself. Which one do I need to have access to? The HTML that came from the server or the HTML the way it's currently rendered? The way it's currently rendered. And so just doing this and looking at the source will get me part way down the road, but it turns out Internet Explorer makes some substantial changes between what's even if there's no active content involved. So ultimately, we want to see this, but we want to see the version that we're currently working with. And so to do that, I'm going to come here and say a.showSource. So what, what the agent will do when you say show source is it says, well, I have, the agent has access to the web page as currently rendered. It's just going to take that, save it to a local file, and open that local file with your default browser. It's not going to do anything with the style sheets that it's depending on, so it's going to look hideous. But it'll be the source in a faithful way that you can look at it. So I'm going to go ahead and execute that. This line is really just for debugging. You wouldn't really leave this in production code. Debugging. Dub. Debugging. Show the source. Okay, so it has saved that page. 
you can see it's got a local path here. See users, G. Allen downloads. It's just saves it in the same location where the workbook is, and then opens it with whatever your default browser is. So now, if I look at the source of this one, I should see this page exactly as I have access to it. And so I'm trying to understand this page by looking at this source. And I've got to find out the object that has them, because I've got to get my program to type in my net ID right here. So any thoughts on how I should go about finding that? Well, there's this word net ID. Let me just, let me just look for ID colon and see what that finds for me. ID colon. Here it is. So net ID, so here's a label. Can you see that okay? Here's a label. It says net ID. It's got some span over here so I can get to it with a hotkey or something. But then right below it, I've got an input. And it turns out that the input tag is the one I'm after. So it's input, it's got a name, username, it's got a tab index, it has an ID, and it has a value. So right now the value is blank. If it, if it you know, came with a value preloaded in it, the, it would be written right here. So I've got to change this property of the object that's sitting right here. And here's how I do it. Just come to my immediate window, and we'll get there. So I'm going to say a dot with my agent dot document. So the document is the HTML document that is currently being shown in the agent. Dot, and unfortunately that's the end of the IntelliSense help. So dot, I get to the document okay, and I don't get anything else after document. Why not? The answer is, is I am about to start calling functionality that is not built into the agent, but is built into the Internet Explorer object. And so VBA just doesn't have access to that. It doesn't know what that is. It's, it's not inside of the agent file. So there is a collection called all. All is the collection of all HTML tags in that document. I can, I can count it. Now it turns out when I have a collection in VBA, I want to see how many are in it. I use the count property. This collection is defined in Internet Explorer, and so it's a different method than we're used to, or a different property to get to the count. Instead of saying count, I say length. And that'll tell me how many tags there are on this page. I can refer to those tags by their number, or if they have a name or ID property, I can refer to it by the name or the ID. So if I come back here and look at the source here, what I'm seeing is it's got a name, username, it's got an ID, net ID. Either one of those should do it for me. I like ID better, so let's give ID a shot. So instead of saying, asking for the length, I want to identify this by its ID. Hmm, it's probably case sensitive. And ID is in, it's actually called net ID. And it's all lowercase, all lowercase. Net ID. Every tag, the only property that I know of that every tag has is the tag name. And so I'm just going to ask it to echo back the tag name for me. And if that executes and gives me a name, should be the input, that's the kind of tag it is, it should, it'll just let me know I've gotten to it. So it says, yeah, you've got an input tag here. Super. So that's the one. So I have now identified that particular object in my HTML document, and I am ready to give it a value. So the property I want is value, and I will just say that equals my net ID. You've been waiting for it, and here's the magical moment. I'm going to run that line, and you will see it put a net ID right there on that browser. It's like magic. Yes, in the back. Could over that again really fast? I could go over it moderately fast. I'd hate to go really fast because it probably wouldn't do any good. Moderate. Okay, moderately fast. Okay, so this, in fact, let me go ahead and I'm going to bring this statement up into the immediate window to play with it. So A is a reference to the agent, that, that object that's controlling Internet Explorer. 
it has a property in it called document, which is a reference to the document that is inside of Internet Explorer. That object has a collection called all. It is the collection of all the tags. So if I look here, it says, oh, here's a tag, here's another tag, here's another tag. There's 50 of them. Just 50? It's really, rare. It's really strange to have a page with so few tags. Typically, the number of tags on a page is in the thousands. This is a really simple page. I mean, look at the page. It's tiny. You can fit it all on just one page. It's small. So there's only 50 HTML tags in the document, and that's what each one of these, that's what's in this collection called all. I can refer to this hmm, by the number. I'll just ask the tag name of the very first tag. That's the HTML tag. I should be able to go find that over here. There it is, HTML. The first tag is the HTML tag. And so I'm asking for the number zero tag, it's the HTML tag. If I ask for the, the number one tag, it's head. I go look at it here, here's the first tag, here's the next tag, head. And so this collection gets me to each of the individual tags inside the document. And so get back here. So I want to find the one that is going to result in, if I change its properties, it will change the value that's sitting right here in the net ID box. So this is an input tag. I tracked it down by searching for this net ID. I found it here, and it's the next tag right here. I can then change the value property through the code that I have here. I'm referring to that by its ID. You can use the name. I can use either its number, its name, or its ID to get to it. I'm changing the value property, and then whatever I put in here, hmm, what's our president's name? Kevin Worthen. K-W-R-T-H-E-N. Let's log in as if we're Kevin Worthen. I don't know his password, so we're not going to get very far with this example. But when I execute that line, you'll see that it's changed that net ID here. How are we feeling? Okay, so if you, if you, if I, so what's the difference between these two lines? So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm printing out a property of the object I've identified right here. So the tag name property just tells me what kind of tag it is. This is an input tag. If I wanted to, I could print the name of that tag, and it would tell me the username. It's a different property. There's, a, there's also a property called ID. And that will print me the, the ID of that. And so the, uh, I, I can print the value. And it will tell me what's currently being shown in that, in that object. And so I've just identified the object that I want to refer to. And then refer to the property that I want to modify. And so that's what I'm doing here. Identified the object. Identify the property, and then I'm changing the value of that property. Other questions? Yeah. So, again, just to read, just to make sure I read that right, you can choose things in the uh, HTML code code that are modified by ID, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah, so the question is so as long as it's got an ID or a name, I can just go to it directly by its ID or name? That's correct. What if, it doesn't have an, what if it doesn't have an ID? What if I wanted to deal with something, what if I wanted to deal with this tag? There's no name or ID. Can I get to it? Yeah, I've got to figure out what its number is. And if the page is stable, it's always going to be that number, I can just put that number. If it's not stable, then it's a little more difficult. What I'll end up doing is saying, write a loop that kind of looks through all the tags, find the one that has the characteristics I want, and then say, aha, that's the one I want to manipulate, and then manipulate it by number. So if it's got a name, or an ID, your life is easy. If it doesn't, your life gets a little bit harder. But the good news is, in terms of putting values into pages, they almost always have names or IDs. They got to have a name so that when you submit it, it, it gives it a name to that value to be sent off to the server. So they almost always have either a name or an ID. When they don't, we can still usually get around it. Okay. 
Here's another way that I can look at the properties of a particular part of this page. Instead of going and looking at the source, uh, depending on the version of the browser I'm using, I should be able to right click it and say inspect or inspect element. And that should take me to something dealing directly with that tag that I clicked on. And so here it's taken me just here to the input tag. That's nice. I don't have to, don't have to necessarily open up the source and, and dig through it to get to it. Right click, inspect, and it should take me there. And so looking here, I'm seeing this has an ID of password. And so to enter the password should be something almost the same as the, the uh, net ID. So I'll just copy this line. And I will wish that I had saved my work. Uh, cancel. What's the question? Who's Microsoft going to blame? I'm using a Microsoft browser. I'm using a Microsoft operating system, Microsoft product on a Microsoft computer. There's no one else to blame here, folks. Oh, they'll blame me, user error. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, oh, wow, it saved itself. That's great news. Incidentally, you'll notice that I'm an XLSB now. What does that mean? Not an XLSM, it's an XLSB. Am I in trouble? Yeah, it actually stands for binary. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alternate version of the file. It's actually smaller than an XLSM. I could just save it this way. I'm going to save it as an XLSM, though. So before I do anything else, I'm going to do a save as and get this saved as an XLSM. There's a question here in the middle. Really? Neat. Shouldn't be an issue of your default browser. Stand by, let's take a look. The show source is going to open that in your default browser. Let's go, we'll take a look at that in just a second. Let me get, let me get saved. XLSM agent winter 16. OK, so uh, did I have show source? Yeah, so this show source is going to show the source of that with your default browser. And remember, this is just for debugging. So you're going to put a comment in front of that line and be done with it. Where was I? Oh, I was trying to copy this line so I could get the password going. So its ID was password. And I'll put in my password. <laughs> you guys were hoping I'd slip up and actually put in my learning suite password. A's for everybody. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and I'll put a breakpoint on N sub. And we should be able to watch this now, go all the way through that, and show that page. It's brought up Internet Explorer, it's put in the information. And it's saying, OK, we're ready for the next step. Feeling pretty good about that. All right. Other questions? Yes? The question is, how do you write the class module? And the answer is, if you want to make a class module, you just choose Insert, Class Module, and then you Google how to make a class module. So there's lots of requirements for that to be able to, to behave like an object. Um, but it's beyond the scope of this. It's beyond the scope of the session for today, and it's beyond the scope for this class. So, so oh, so could we create one for Chrome? Is the question. So could we make one of these that works with Chrome? And the answer is we could if and when Google exposes the core functionality of Chrome to the component object model, which they are showing no signs of doing. There's another project out there called Selenium that's supposed to allow this to happen. I haven't played with it. But I just talked with our textbook author who's working on that chapter right now. And uh, he says he's going to probably write about Selenium. And so maybe by the end of the semester, you'll have a chapter that shows you how to, how to manipulate Chrome in the textbook. So I've read a little bit about it, but I haven't ever tried it. Could you, instead of using TMA as agent, set A to be agent? Place all the A dot with agent dot. Oh, so could we just skip all this and come in here and say agent dot open page? The answer is no. I have to have a variable that is a reference to a newly created object to be able to do that. 
So yeah, I can't just take a class name and refer to it. I have to instantiate that class, bind a variable to it, and use that variable. Yeah, it's tempting. And the reason is, and it's good that we don't do it that way, because this allow, would allow us to have two or three different agents open at once. So I can have one called A, one called B, one called C, and they could all be you know, looking at different web pages or looking at different parts of a web page, and we may see how to do that here as well. All right, so next step is I've got to get this form to submit. So I'm just going to look at this sign in button and see if that's conveniently, if it has a name or an ID on it, That'll be really easy to get to. I'll just get to it and click on it. So I'll inspect the element and take a look. So there's an input. It's of type submit. That's the, is that the one? Seems like there should be something that says it's got a button on it. Yeah, I don't believe that's what that is. Name, event type, L, I don't know. Part of the form. Tab index for class is submit, type is submit. Hmm. Really, oh, you know what? Probably has its image coming in from the style sheet. That's what it is. So its style sheet has defined that image. Well, I don't see it here in the HTML. But there's no name on it. Hmm. So that's one option is to do it by its name. We could still get to this object and click it. But let's take a look at the other approach since I want to show that to you anyway. So I should be able to find where this form begins. So here's the end of the form, slash form, and here's the beginning of a form. So in HTML, when I'm going to collect a set of values from a user and then send those values off to a server to be processed, I do that with a form tag. And so these input tags, let's see, where's the one that has the username in it? Here's the username, and here's the password. So these are all part of this form. Right? I collapse the form. And those go away. Where'd my form go? And my form goes away. Oh, here it is. So they're all part of this form. So my other approach, rather than finding that button and clicking it, is to find the form and then submit the form. We'll see if this works. So this form has an ID. It's called credentials. So I should be able to refer to that the same way that I've referred to these others. So document.all. To get to that tag using its ID, credentials. And I don't want to modify a property of it. I want to call a method. Submit. So now I'm hoping that when I execute that line, that it will submit this form. So I'll click on play. And play. And it looks like it submitted it. Unable to sign in, invalid password. That's right, I didn't really put my password in there. But the point is, you could see that I submitted it. And so that's going to get that to submit. So how many of you actually put your real password in, and you actually got submitted, and you went to Learning Suite? So it looks like a few of you. Any of you trying to do it but didn't get it to work? So a couple of you over here. So Super TA, if you could come and check and see what they're, these guys are doing, they might have some struggle that you might be able to help them with. Question? Ah, is there a way to encrypt your password? And the answer is not really in the source. So, but what you could do is you could put it in a file, and then you could encrypt that file. Then you could read it in and decrypt it. So that would give you a little more protection. But anyone who has access to the source could put a breakpoint there and run your thing, and ultimately, whatever you're plugging in right there, they could inspect and look at. Uh, and so it, it really doesn't give you better protection from an informed user. It would protect your password from your mother if you did that. Um, but yeah, yeah, so but there are some other options we have for working with that password. And we'll actually take a look at one of them today. Now, if you just didn't want you know, the casual observer to see it, there's other ways to write that. There's other ways to write this, right? So I could look for, you know, let's say my password starts with a G. You know, that's character number 103. And so I could just print character number 103, right? That's a G. And so I could say my password is character 103, concatenated with character number 92, concatenated with whatever. 
and you know, that would keep someone who's looking over your shoulder, looking at your code while you have it open from seeing your password. But it wouldn't protect it. Again, they could they can run the code and put a breakpoint. They can get that password. Yep? Ah, so that's, that's another option, is that I could, I probably don't want to use an input box because it would come in clear text, someone looking over your shoulder could see it, but I could create a user form, we'll see how to do that, that actually puts up a password, you, know, you enter in the password and it, and it masks it so you don't see it. Um, but there's actually a slicker way to do it, which I'll show you today. Okay, so that gets us signed in. But this is not just signing in, this is any time I've got to fill in a value to a website. Right? Find that tag, plug the value in, submit the form, oh, and then wait for the page to move on. Watch what happens. Watch the timing on this. I am going to run these last two lines. It's going to put a password in. It's going to click this, the, the submit credentials. I'm just going to, it's going to submit the form. But watch which one happens first. Do I hit the breakpoint or does the page load first? Let's run it and find out. I'm at the breakpoint. It's still loading. There, it's finally loaded the page. And so when I say open page, open page is a method of the agent class. It knows how to wait until the page is loaded. When I click the submit, or when I say submit the form, I'm invoking functionality that's deep inside the browser. The agent doesn't know how to wait for that. And so I need to tell the agent to wait. Fortunately, there's a method for that. Wait for load. So anytime I invoke some functionality that's going to change me to a different page on the browser, I got to tell my agent to hold on. Slow down until that's loaded. So I'm going to go ahead and run this again now with the wait for load. And we should see that I don't get the yellow breakpoint, I don't get the yellow current statement indicator on the breakpoint line until this page is done loading. It's waiting, it's trying, it's trying to get there, trying to validate me, it's definitely trying to check my password. It's hoping that it can validate it. It decides it can't. And then it says, all right, we've gotten to that page. So again, if I'm just saying open page, this method will wait automatically. If I'm invoking the functionality from inside the Internet Explorer object, I've got to tell it to wait. Question in the back. So the question is, how did I make it wait? You want to see, the, you want to see it? It's not that bad. In, uh, I want to view my project browser. I'm lost. Project Explorer. So the question is, how does that wait for load work? And the answer is, it works just like this. So I'm setting up a loop. Do loop. It looks like an endless loop. It's going to continue to loop until something happens inside here. And it's going to loop. It's going to say, listen, if the Internet Explorer object's not busy and the ready state is 4, that means, say, it's done loading, then it's going to wait for 2 seconds and it's going to check again and see if it's still that way. What can happen is that when the page gets down, it'll be, be done loading, but then it'll fire off some local code that will totally change the page, even redirect it to some other place. And so that's why I do this check in two steps. Wait to see that it's loaded. Wait a couple of seconds. Check to see if it's still ready to go. And then we get out of the do and we move on. Otherwise, we stay in that do and we just keep working. The do events statement here yields the processor to other events that might be trying to happen inside of Excel. Yes? Okay, here's the question. It says, hey, is there some way to check to see if I'm already logged in? I mean, if I'm logged in, I don't want to have to log in again. And in fact, what are we doing here? We're, this code assumes, uh, where am I? This code assumes that when I say go to learning suite, I'm going to end up at the net ID. But if I'm already logged in, it's going to take me right to learning suite. And then it's going to try to log me in. Is there going to be a net ID on my Learning Suite page? It's not going to be. So when I try to get to that, it's going to fail. So that's great. It's a good question. So how do we say, well, I don't want to log in unless I need to log in? So let's find out. So yeah, there is a way to do that. Let's take a look. So built into the object are a set of properties and methods 
that are used for parsing the HTML source file. And it really behaves much like just a text editor. So here's what I want to do. So I'm looking at the source of this page. And let me just open this source in a text editor so it's a little plainer. All right, so here, this is that HTML page. So just looking at this source, is there something I could look for in this page to say, you know, if that text is here, I'm at the page I want to be at. If it's not here, I must already be logged in. Is there something about this page that I could look for? Let's say, aha, there's something on this page that's not on the page I'm ultimately trying to get to. The page that I'm going to get routed to automatically if I'm already logged in. Yeah, what do you think? OK, let's take a look. So up here, there's going to be a title. It'll be a title tag. And right here, Brigham Young University sign-in service. My guess is it doesn't say that on the title of the Learning Suite page. So yeah, so let's do that. We'll use that to let us know, are we on the page that we need to log into? So I'm just going to, I'm going to, that's really neat. There we go. I'm going to copy that. And I'm going I'm to have my code ask, is, do I find this text in the source of the page? If so, I need to log in. If not, I'm already logged in. Don't log in. I've already gotten to the place I need to go. OK, so you see what we're going to try to do? We're going to try to decide, do we need to log in on this page? OK, so we're going to open the page. And before we try to, to get to the Net ID page, we're going to check, hey, am I already logged in? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start off by setting the position of my agent. A dot position equals 1. If you think about looking at a text document and saying, I want to search for this, what would happen if I was right here and I said, Control F, search for that string? You see, I'm right down here. I say, find next. It's going to say, I can't find it. But if I'm way up here at the top and I search, then it's going to find that, and it's going to move my current position indicator right to that, I mean, my uh, insertion point right to there. So this same idea is built into the agent. I want to set the position to say, where am I searching from? I'm searching from the very first character of the document. And then I want to say, if a dot move to. So move to is like find. I'm going to tell it, what am I looking for? I'm looking for that string. And it will return true or false. It will return true if it finds it, false if it doesn't find it. And so if I can move to this, then I must be on the page I want to log into. I'll put my end if after that block, and I will tab this in. So if I can move to that text, I must be on the login page, log me in. Question? So could we use a.document.all.title.value? The answer is, yes, we could. That would work. So why am I sh showing you this position and move to? Because there are many things that I want to extract off of that that I can't just do that with. So this is a, this is a separate set of methods. It's a property and a method that I can use together that will allow me to kind of parse through that page. There's another question over here somewhere. Um, OK, so hold on a second. So why can't we say A, all, and then title? Title's not the ID or the name. The only way I can refer to the, to the object that way is by ID or name. I can't get to it by its tag name. There are other ways I could find the title tag, but, but just that, that approach. All right, so let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and give that a shot. So first of all, let me get myself to where I'm actually logged in. Well, let's make sure it still tries to log me in. So I'm going to try to open this page. And there at that page, I'm searching for that title. It must have found it because it let me in here. And now it'll go through this whole process and try to log me in. But now what happens if I'm already logged in when I go there?
Apparently nothing. Is my caps lock on? No. My net ID is correct. I'm positive I typed the password correct. See, there we go. I just couldn't, you know, type my own password. All right, so let's go back here now again. I'm going to try to navigate to this page. Like, let's go somewhere else so I can see it go. Okay, I'm going to try to navigate to this page. And it takes me straight to this learning suite page that I'm already logged in. So now I'm going to look. Can I move to the title equals sign in service? No, I can't move to it. And so it skips the login procedure and I'm ready to move on. So, so far so good. So now if I'm logged in, I just go and I'm ready to move on. If I'm not logged in, it'll log me in. Question? The question is, do I want to put the wait for load after the if because I want to wait for load in both cases? And the answer is I don't want to move that wait for load. It belongs right here because this wait for load is waiting for the submit of the form. When I say open the page here, the open page has a wait for load built into it. I mean, I, I mean it really does. It, it's not that it just, it, it happens to wait magically. Um, view, stand by, view, project explorer, come to the agent, open page. So here's the, oh, that's open page Mac. Here's open page. So if we're using Internet Explorer, here's what we do. If it's not initialized, we initialize it. And then we say navigate to the URL. And right there, it says wait for load. So the open page method actually calls the same wait for load method inside the agent. So that's why we don't have to say wait for load um, outside of this loop, because this wait for load is only for the submit. This open page will wait to proceed there as well. OK, so that's one way to log in. I'm going to put this as one option. This is the automatic option. Someone raised the issue. Good heavens. We're making the password public here. We're actually putting the password here in the text. It's a really bad idea. You're right. It's a bad idea. So other options we have, collect it from the user, and then put it in. Still, we're bringing that password into the code. It's probably not as bad, because the person who's putting the password in is the one in control of the computer. But you know, could we do it without even ever bringing the password into VBA? And the answer is yes. So I'm going to comment this whole block out. Hmm. Somewhere there's a tool on my. Mm, toolbars. Is there a toolbars properties window? Does it say toolbars here? Oh, thank you. Toolbars. Edit. This toolbar gives me a button right here that lets me comment out a whole block of code. I can uncomment it or comment it. It's nice. Okay, so that's the automatic option. Here is the option to let the user log in. Let the user log himself, him, or herself. All right, so let's think about this. The agent is visible. I brought it up to the surface. I took us to this page. I'm now, che whoops. I'm now checking to see, do I need to log in? And where's, where's my end if? So I'm checking to see if I, need to, if I need to log in. That page is there. It's showing on the screen. Could I just wait here until the user logs in? The answer is yes, I can do that. So here's what I'm going to do. I am just going to put myself into a loop. Do loop. Inside this loop, I'm going to wait for load, a dot wait for load. 
That wait for load just puts me inside of a loop that has that do events into it. So that do events will kind of pause the whole agent, wait for the thing to load, and then it will check again, check again, check again. So I'm going to con continually waiting for that page to load. Once it loads, I can do something with the loop. So I'm going to keep doing this until there's some characteristic of the page that I'm looking for that is you know, what I'm trying to go to. So until a dot document dot, and I think the property that I want is called, hmm, I think it's called location, but I'm not sure, so let's take a look. So let me just see what the location of the current document is. A dot document dot location. So I've got this comment. I've got to have this be valid syntax before I can run anything up here. There we go. So a dot document dot location. This is the URL that my web page is currently looking at. Now I'm not going to know exactly what this is because I get this little extra piece put on each time I log in. But they're using something to manage my session. I'm not sure what that is. But if my location says learning suite in it, then I'm hmm. If it say, if it starts with HTTPS learning suite. I'll know I've gotten to the page I'm trying to get to. So I'm going to do until the left of the document's location, document dot OK, so I want to I want to kind of sit here and wait, wait till it's loaded, wait, I'm checking until the leftmost characters, hmm, how many I'm not sure is equal to that learning suite. How long is that? I don't know. Erg. So that is 29 characters. So the leftmost 29 characters of that equals learning suite. So do you see what I'm doing here? I'm opening the page. If I can move to the page, the part of the page that tells me I'm trying to log in, I'm going to put myself into a loop, and I'm going to continually wait here until the document is pointing at the page I'm trying to get to. Once it's there, I want it to move on. So let's see how this works. Let me log myself out. Take me back to the beginning of this code. Opening that page. Page should be open and it should take me to a breakpoint. Still running. Did I? I don't think I had run. Am I running? I must have hit F5 instead of Shift F8 to go one line at a time. Oh, yeah, so I'm down here. I'm down here in this loop. So. It's sitting here, running on this loop, waiting for me to log in. It's sitting here. Wait, it's still running. Where does it say running? It says RU. That means running. It's still running. I haven't gotten to the breakpoint yet. Now I'm going to log in. It detected that I was logged in. It realized that it got to the... It got to where the location of the document said learning suite at the beginning of it. And so it let me out of that loop and let me move on. So what this approach does, it just brings up the browser, takes me to the login page, it realizes, oh, I'm at the login page. Wait here until the user logs in. As soon as that user logs in, it realizes, oh, I'm logged in, continue on and work with the code, which would be to go and get whatever data I'm after. Questions? The question is, can I go back to the code? The answer is, most gladly. The question was something more about you know, what they put in hot dogs. I don't know. But I, I, I given up, I've given up eating them.
Oh, okay. So here's, here, here's the question. So the, the question is, could we do this? Could we say, you know what, I don't want to show the browser. Instead, I want to get to that point, realize, oh, I've got to log in. And instead of ever showing the browser to them, you know, leave us down here, but instead of just plugging these in and having them hard-coded, at this point, prompt the user to enter a username and password. Yes. I wouldn't use input boxes. I would create a user form that collects both of those pieces of information at once and then brings in. I'll show you how to do the user forms as part of the class. Uh, so yeah, we could do this, and we could never, ever make the Internet Explorer object visible to the user. So it could be there, running, hidden, going to pages, bringing information in. We can pull the information out and work with it. Yeah? Do security systems fight this kind of thing? The question is, do security systems fight this kind of thing? So the question is, maybe, someone, maybe someone's website doesn't want me to enter in a password by computer. And so do they, do they try to fight this? Well, yeah. In fact, haven't you ever seen this thing called a CAPTCHA on a web page where you've got to say, prove I'm not a robot? Type in these kind of obscured numbers or click on this in a particular way? Absolutely. And so if I'm trying to log in at a place where there's a CAPTCHA, this is not going to work. It, they are specifically saying, you've got to be a human to log in here. And so this approach won't work. Yes, and there are, there are actually several ways that they will you know, try to prevent a computer from logging in. That's one of them. That's the technological way. There are legal ways as well, which we'll probably talk about in a later lecture. So, yeah, I, I'm actually sh I'm teaching you a technique that, you know, by 5 o'clock today, you could break the law substantially. Just with just with what I've shown you today. Um, yeah, because you know, does a website have the right to say, the only way you're allowed to interact with my servers is if you're a human? Yeah, they do. And so you know, today is a technological discussion on this. We'll spend some time before the end of the semester talking about what are the ethical impl implications of this, and how would you know if a website is saying it's against, you know, I, I, I am telling you, you, you'd be trespassing on my servers. If you do this, I'll show you how they, would, how they would signal that. It's not especially obvious. Question here and then here. So like, uh, for example, you have like the auto-mapping options, and then you just like have that going, and then let's say we have some things that we just like pop up to a user, and then the user can the user. So here's the, the question is, well, could we get this part going, and then we could realize, oh, there's a CAPTCHA here. Show that part to the user. Have the user identify it, you know, type it in, and then have us send that through. The answer is yes, we could. And you know, would that be violating what that website wants? I'm not sure. So I mean, there's still there's a person saying, "Yep, I'm here doing this." Um, it's going to prevent you know this computer from hitting that 10,000 times in a minute. But we would have to look more closely to see is our other activity on that site within bounds or out of bounds of what they've specified. All right, well, let's go ahead and actually pull some data in um, in a fairly lightweight way. So let's assume that we've got logged in, we're going where we want to go, and why don't we go to a different page? So one of my favorite places to work with. Oh, there's a question here. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so could you write something like this that would like to check, wait for a time, and go put a bid in at the very last moment? The answer is yes, but there's services that do that for you anyway. Right? You know, there's already people that are doing that, you know, so yeah, you probably would. But the answer is yes. Yeah, you could do that. All right, let's just go to Naxos.com. Who's Naxos? They're the number one purveyor of classical music in the world. Okay, they're actually, you know, why do I use this example? I use this example because this is where I used to use the login and password, because everyone could come here and put a login and password. It's a pretty simple place to do it. But let's suppose that I'm trying to get to this particular page and I want to bring information in. You come to my list of, of, of composers. Ultimately, what I'm going to show, oh, it's kind of slow. Ultimately, what I'm going to show you, maybe we won't go to Nexus. We should go to somewhere else that's got some data. Did I click on that? Is this browser working? Yeah, browser's working. Hmm. Another page with data. Yeah, this is too slow for us. Anyone have a suggestion for a place we can just go and pull some data without having to log in? 
I had to go back to finance.yahoo.com. I guess we could. Our good old example. Go to Southwest Airlines. Feel the love. Okay. So, I mean, here I'm logging into BYU, and then I'm going off to some other URL. The, the point is, you know, realize that the point is that it doesn't really matter where I'm logging in. We've got that log in place. Now I'm sending my, my agent somewhere else to go pull some data in. A dot open page. This URL. Use Internet Explorer. So I'm getting myself logged in, then I'm going off to do some other stuff. So I'll go ahead and, in fact, I don't have to run this line. I'm already there. The, the browser's there. So the fact that I took the browser there doesn't change the fact that the browser is now there. And this page, you know, this code has access to that browser. That's fine. So I'll go ahead and run that line to pull it up. Loading the page. Loading the page. Okay, page is loaded. Uh, and we're going to see just one way to bring data in. So it turns out that the Web Query Wizard is great at bringing in data that I can just get to. So if the, if the data that I need are there, plainly visible and well organized on the page, the only problem is I have to log in to get to it, I can't use the Web Query Wizard. But what if the agent could say, well, hey, I've got the data. I mean, the agent is holding that page right now. The agent has the page. Could we just take the, have the agent say, take that data, write it out to a local file, and then point the Web Query Wizard at the local file? No password necessary then. And pull that data in. And the answer is, yes, we can do that. It is called import data. No, it's called import page. And if you wanted to go see, and you actually see invoking the Web Query functionality to bring that data in, just go look at the import page procedure in the agent, and you'll see it's what I'm doing. Save the page locally, point the Web Query wizard at it, and then I let it do its stuff. I give it a sheet that I want to create or replace to hold that data, sheet name. So I'll just call it data. And so now, if I execute this page, execute that line, it should pull that data in onto a new sheet called data. Here it is. Just exactly as if we had used the Web Query Wizard to pull it in. And, and of course, you know, we could have used the Web Query Wizard on this page. But the idea here is, go to a page that I have to log into, and then once I'm logged in, I've got access to that data, call the import page, method, and it will bring the data in for you using the functionality of the Web Query Wizard. Yeah? So the Web Query can't work on a secure page? So the question is, the Web Query can't work on a secure page? And the answer is, it can work on a secure page, so it works okay with HTTPS encrypted, but it, it's not going to log in to a page for me and then go somewhere else. I've got to give that Web Query Wizard a URL. Here's the URL, go get the data. And if it's two steps, Go to this page, enter this, hit submit, and then go there. The Web Query Wizard won't do it. So I can combine the two this way, you know, using that other functionality that's built into the agent, and then I can say, use the Web Query Wizard to bring the page in. And this is how I say, use the Web Query Wizard. I guess it's not really using the wizard. It's just using the Web Query to do that. OK, when we get together tomorrow, we're going to see how to deal with more complex data and we'll be using this move to, uh, in a little more sophisticated way, to looking at the source of an HTML file, working through pulling off just the pieces that I want. So instead of bringing the data onto a worksheet and then looking through the worksheet to get the data, we're just going to look at the source of the HTML, and we'll look through that, pull out the information that we want iteratively, and bring it on. Question? Are we going to build on this code or write a new subprocedure? Question is, are we going to build on this code or write a new subprocedure? And the answer is, we'll probably build on this code, but I'm going to post this. So you know, even if you haven't followed along, you'll be able to download it. Questions? Yeah. The question is, did I have to create this page data? And the answer is, when I said import page and gave it the name here, this method is going to create that sheet. And if the sheet's already there, it's going to blow it away and recreate it. 
So if you have some important data on a sheet called data, don't call it data, because it'll be gone. And it's not going to ask you. OK, folks, we have a project on this very topic. I, haven't, I don't have the assignment posted yet. So it's uh, two weeks from last Saturday. I've got to get that made. And I have made the website that you're going to use to get the data. I just need to make the assignment to data. All right, folks, I will see you tomorrow. Class dismissed. I can't turn off my recorder. Hold on a second. Ah, there it is.